J.J. Watt, everybody. Thank you, thank you. J.J., welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is, uh, this this is, is pretty I know this is kind of a small crowd for you. No, I know, I, I know. And then I saw the last guy take his jacket off and show his guns a little bit, so I didn't know if I could just <laughs> keep that rolling or what the plan was. I'll keep it on. I'll yeah, keep it, yeah, I'll yeah, keep yeah. It on. I'll keep it on. Let's keep I mean, it. On. Look at me. Look at you. Uh, Adobe's smart, right? They they bring out the, like the ultimate physical specimen in the NFL, and then they put this sports reporter who could stand to eat a couple cheeseburgers for every meal right next to you. <laughs> so Adobe's very smart. They end right there with Peyton Manning, who was on this stage with me last year. Perfect segue right. to you, Walter Peyton Man of the Year. For people out there that don't know what the Walter Payton Man of the Year is, can you explain it to them? What is it? I mean, personally, I'm so humbled and honored to have won it. It is, in my opinion, the highest honor as an athlete in the NFL that you can get, because we do things on the field, we perform, we work hard, we play the games, um, but the Wal Walter Payton Award is about what you do off the field. It's about the type of person you are, it's about the work that you do in your community, and I was fortunate to be nominated with two other great, great guys. And there's guys all around the league that do a bunch of great work for their communities and give back. And for me, it's all about shining a light on the positivity. You know, our world today is so negative and there's so many headlines out there that are all about the negativity. Mm -hmm. The more that we can shine a light on that positivity, the more that we can spread the word about people doing good, the more that we encourage others to do good as well. And I think that the more we promote that, the better we're gonna be. I've got this football, yeah. And before we step off the stage, we're gonna sign this and we're gonna hand this off, but football has kind of given you this platform right. that, that maybe didn't exist. So you take this football and you, and you look at a football, what does a football mean to you? Different than what it did 10, 20 years ago. Oh, easily. I mean, it literally changed my life. It gave me the life I have today. I mean, I'm, I grew up back where I'm from in Wisconsin, you can start playing football in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So I started playing football in fifth grade and my dream was to be the varsity quarterback. I wanted to, I didn't, I, I would grow up a Packer fan in, in the state of Wisconsin, you have to be, otherwise yeah. they kick you out. Right. So I, uh, I grew up, and my high school quarterback at the time, his name was J.J. Boyk, he wore number five. I was J.J. Watt, I wore number five. I was like, this is destiny. I'm gonna be the Pewaukee High School quarterback, I'm gonna be the coolest dude around, like, awesome. Um, and then I realized, you know, worked my way up to, to wanting to play on varsity in high school, and then I was like, okay, what's my next goal? And then. That's really where I started to learn about goal setting and about achieving what I wanted to achieve. And what I ended up doing when I was about a sophomore in high school, I set my goals. I said, I want to go, I want to play in the NFL someday. So then I just worked backwards from there. I said, what do I need to do to play in the NFL? Probably need to play at college, hopefully get a scholarship and, and start at a good school. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I need to get good grades. I need to play good in high school. And then I just broke it down all the way down to one day. What do I need to do today to make my dreams come true? And that day it was wake up before school and work out, eat a good meal, do my homework, be a good student. And then I just kept doing that. And every single day I found out how I could build towards my biggest goal. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, here I am and uh, yeah. it all worked out pretty well. It did work out pretty well. <clears throat> the theme here this week obviously is make experience your business and no one in the sporting world uh, obviously better exemplifies that right now than you. Let's, let's go back to August. Hurricane Harvey hits the Houston area. Where were you and what was your first reaction once you started to understand the magnitude of what had happened? Uh, I was in Dallas. So what had happened is we were in New Orleans. We were practicing against the Saints. And they saw the hurricane coming and it came and we couldn't fly back into Houston because the airports were closed. The flooding had already started to hit. So they rerouted us to Dallas. We were stuck in Dallas. Uh, all of our families, friends, my girlfriend, were back in Houston with the flooding. And we were sitting in a hotel conference room in Dallas watching the Weather Channel on TV. And we were watching, I saw streets that I drive down every single day. I saw streets that were two blocks away from my house, completely flooded, houses completely underwater, people jumping in boats to help save their fellow neighbor. Um, it was a helpless feeling. It was, it was extremely helpless because you sit there and these people, I lived there for seven years, and these people have supported me. They wear my jersey, they show up to our games, they cheer for us, they support my charity. And you want to help. I wanted, I wanted to help. I wanted to go out there. I wanted to jump in the boats. I wanted to help save people, but we literally couldn't get back. So I did the only thing I knew 
I could do is I use the social media platform that I had. I use the internet to try and rally the troops. And I mean, I, I don't, I'm not kidding when I say I didn't know if it would reach $200,000. I set the goal at $200,000. I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm going to set this at $200,000. I don't know if people are going to join me. I hope they join me. Um, but I just, I want to do something. And it took on a life of its own. And 37 something million dollars oh. later, we, uh, we helped a lot of people. So you kind of led me right into when we're talking make experience your business. So that's the experience, the business part, in a way, right. if you want to call it that, in, in helping uh, this flood relief and these victims of this was to raise this money. Right. Now, your goal was $200,000. Right. What I think a lot of people don't realize when they hear, whoa, it went from that to 37 million was, of those 37 million, you had 200,000 people yeah. donate. The original goal was in right. dollars, it ended up becoming in actual people. Right. That just blow you away? It, it completely blew me away. And it was only over a course of 19 days, which was unbelievable. And I think it almost became a case study. Like I felt like I was watching a case study play out right in front of right. me. I saw day by day, I saw it go from 200 to 500. I saw it go from 500 to a million, 1 million to 5 million. And I saw people jumping on board, whether it was big name celebrities who wanted to get in on the action and wanted to help and didn't know where to go, so they joined us, or whether it was my high school football coach. He sent me a text. He said, hey, I don't, I don't really do Twitter much, but my boys just came up to me and said they wanted to donate their chore money to you. He <laughs> said, I don't know what you're doing, but I told him it's a good spot to put it. And I said, that was, that was pretty cool to me uh, to have my high school football coach's two sons say they wanted to donate their chore money. And I had kids put up lemonade stands in Pennsylvania and California and people all over the country and all over the world wanting to join in. And what I learned was people want to be a part of something positive. People want to help out their fellow human. Some of these people just didn't know where to go. And, and I'm very fortunate. I get these awards and I've been able to um, do some great things, but I don't, I don't look at it like I deserve the credit. I look at it like those 200,000 people deserve the credit. All I did was coordinate the effort. All I did was give them an opportunity to help. They saw their fellow human in trouble. They wanted to find a way to help. And we all came together and social media and combining the internet and social media and the power of good all came together. And we're helping put hundreds of people back in their homes. We're helping to rebuild over a thousand daycare and childcare centers, providing food, um, medical care, physical and mental health care to people. Um, so it's really, really incredible what people can do when they come together for a good cause. We, you win the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award at the Super Bowl in Minneapolis, but then, then you get to go to Monaco. Right. The Laureus Sporting Inspiration World, that's on a global level. Right. Both cases, some profound words when you were accepting these awards. What did you say and why did you feel like you needed to say it in that manner? Both times I just tried to explain how much good there is in the world. Because I'm like anybody else. I read the news, I see the stories every single day. I, there's a bit of a grim outlook. I mean, just looking around and seeing uh, some of the division and everything that goes on. But what I witnessed over those 19 days in the camaraderie, in the community, and everybody joining together, didn't matter what background you came from, where you live, who you are, what your affiliation was, people came together because they saw that their fellow human needed help. And that was the message I wanted to get across at these awards and to people everywhere is, there is a lot of good out there. There are a lot of really, really good people out there in the world who want to do really good things and help each other out and be special and make this world a better place. We just need to shine more light on that. We just need to help cultivate that and make each other better. Because if we look at the people around us and we lift them up and we help give them that platform to be positive and be good, and just live with that positive mindset, we're all gonna be better for it because we're gonna spread it, you're gonna spread it a little here, I'm gonna spread it a little there, and we're all gonna have a better world to live in because of that. Well, it comes from being genuinely a good person. Okay? So I, I think everyone in here right now can just sense just listening to this guy talk, he's a pretty good person, right? Wow. Uh, and it's not just what you did with Hurricane Harvey. There, there, 
you've been doing this for a while. That just really broadened it for you. But a couple years ago, you spent Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day with children uh, at a hospital. You, you've spent time as Batman at Texas Children's Hospital. So this isn't anything new to you. You've, you want to get out in the community you always have to give back and kind of spread that positive vibe, I guess. I'm very fortunate. I have two great parents who, who love me and show me the way. We weren't rich, but we weren't poor. We were a middle class family growing up. My dad was a firefighter. My mom started out as a secretary at her company and worked her way up to become the vice president. Um, they taught me that we didn't have everything in the world, but we also had enough. And we, I had dinner on the table every night. I was very fortunate. They showed me what it means to give back. In high school, um, in middle school even, my parents taught me about going out into your community and helping out wherever you mm -hmm. could. Um, then in college, just going back and, and teaching me to give back. And I started my foundation in college with my mom and one of my friends from back home, just us three in the basement mm -hmm. of my house. Um, I understand that I'm fortunate to have that situation. I also understand that there's tons of people out there that don't necessarily have that same situation at home. Um, so what I want to do is, I play football for a living. I chase around this little ball. Mm -hmm. I hope I get it. <laughs> and they pay me a lot of money to do it. I mean, like, seriously, it's awesome. It's incredible. It's the best job in the world. I couldn't ask for a better job. But let's be honest, if I don't use that platform to do something good, I kind of wasted it. And so that's just what my parents taught me, is, is you have all these great things. They taught me that I'm very fortunate, and they, they just taught me to make sure that I helped out those who weren't as fortunate as I was. As all this was transpiring here in the last six, seven months, did you realize that your persona was kind of transforming before your very eyes? Did you, did you feel that in this groundswell of, of giving that J.J. Watt, the football player, was, for a lot, in a lot of people's minds, has now become J.J. Watt, the humanitarian? I've noticed that, and part of it is incredible. I'm very fortunate, I'm grateful for that. The other part of me says, dude, get back on the field and tackle somebody, you know? <laughs> because I've been away from the game for two years. I've had two of the toughest years of my life, personally, yeah. uh, in having season-ending injuries two years in a row. Um, but that was another beautiful thing that came out of all this. I went through two of the most difficult years I've ever been through. I'm an athlete, I've had a fortunate career, had a lot of success, and then Two years in a row, I had something happen that I've never had happen before. I, I couldn't play. And going through the hurricane recovery and meeting some of the people and meeting some of these families and seeing their hope and seeing their smiles throughout the toughest situations they're going through, which is way tougher than me breaking my leg, getting, being out of your house for six, seven months, having everything washed away, seeing the hope in their eyes and seeing how positive they were throughout that helped push me through everything I was going through. I, there, I was depressed. There's moments that I was extremely sad, depressed. I mean, the game I love was taken away from me. I couldn't do what I expected to be able to do. But these people helped show me the light and show me that, you know, one day at a time, just go in one day at a time, just like their homes were rebuilt, one right. day at a time, rip out, the, rip out the mold, put up some walls, put up some floors, one day at a time, and you'll get there. And that's helped to motivate me to where I am today, and I can't wait to get back on the field not only for myself, but also for all those people who helped inspire me so I can kind of show them, hey, you helped me too. I think we've got a couple tweets that hopefully we can put up on the board that I found th that you've done, and, and here's a couple of them. And this is a family in particular, the Gutierrez family, before and then after when you were getting them into their new home, correct? Yeah, yeah, that was just a couple weeks ago we finally got them back into their home. You go and you look and they show you the water line. The water line is at my eyeballs, and you can, you can see the pictures, and you see the water in the photos, and it's just devastating. And I believe the stat was something like 87% of the people in the flood did not have any sort of flood insurance. So, I mean, that is, right. they're looking around, and they showed me the homes on their street. Of the five homes on their street, three of the people still have not been back to clean it out, to move back in. They just called it a wash. They, they lost. They maybe moved in with family or whatever it was. Um, but when you go in on the day that you get to hand them those keys and say, welcome home, there's no better feeling in the world and there's no bigger smiles and bigger hugs um, than those days. And there's also no funnier moments. That house, when we moved them back in, they had a ceiling fan on their back porch 
and I was walking from the kitchen outside into their back patio, smoked my head uh. right, in the, <laughs> right in the forehead, ceiling fan to the face. So <laughs> there's ups and downs with every day, guys. It's, it's, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, yeah. The, the other one that I found here, there was a 19-year-old that just sent you a, a quick message and said, how do I get better? And this was your story kind of in a nutshell of how you weren't a huge recruit coming out of high school. You actually were a tight end, not a defensive end and defensive tackle. You wanted to catch the balls, which you've right. done, you right. know, your fair right. share a little in the bit. NFL. But that wasn't your goal coming out of high school. You went to Central Michigan, didn't work out the way you wanted it to. And this kind of speaks right. to what you were delivering pizzas I for was. a time. Like, I mean, right. All part I, of the journey for you. All part of the journey, you know. So I left Central Michigan, like I said earlier, I, I came from a middle class family. I got a full scholarship to college, so everything was paid for, which I was very thankful for. I was the starting tight end at Central Michigan. We won the, champion, the conference championship. I mean, when I look at that, if you told me in high school, you're going to start your freshman year on a conference championship Division I team and have a full scholarship, I would have said, give me that in a yeah. heartbeat. Um, but I wasn't satisfied. I got to play about 15 plays a game, just the way the offense was set up. Um, and I had, as I talked about earlier, big dreams. I wanted to play in the NFL. So I gambled on myself. I called my parents. Uh, I said, hey, this just isn't what I want. This is, I want something bigger. I want a challenge. I want a big challenge. I said, I want to transfer to Wisconsin. And they said, we're going to be perfectly honest with you. We have enough money for, to pay for about one year of college. And I knew I would have to walk on at Wisconsin. I wouldn't have a scholarship. So mm -hmm. I'd have to get a scholarship after one year. And I knew, because of the transfer rule, you can't play in games for your first year. And no player at Wisconsin had gotten a scholarship without playing in a game. Uh, no walk-on. So I said, all right, I'm all in. I got one year to get myself a scholarship. Otherwise, my football career, my college career, it's done. Um, I was talking about this yesterday with my buddy who was here with me. I said, that's kind of like a Vegas move. I said, we pushed the chips <laughs> all in. And I had no clue what the outcome was going to be. Yeah. But the difference between my situation and Vegas is that I got to control it. I got to control how hard I worked. I got to control if I woke up and put in that time every single day. And that's the beauty about life that's different than gambling, is you control your bets. You control your all-in situations. In my opinion, if you want something great, if you want to have that sweetest, my high school coach uses this, he talks about a tree. The sweetest fruit is at the top of the tree. You have to climb all the way to the top of that tree, and the fall from up there hurts like hell. You can stay at the bottom if you want. The fruit's not that good, but it's safe. If you fall, you're OK. You can climb back up. But the fruit at the top of that tree, that's the sweetest fruit. And that's what I wanted. So I climbed, and I climbed, and I climbed, and I knew. I had one year. If I didn't make it within one year, I was falling all the way from the top of that tree. And there wasn't a way to get back up there. So I did every single day. I delivered pizzas to earn money for myself so I could help pay for books and things like that to help me get through. Uh, I put in the work with a trainer back home. I went to Wisconsin. I walked on. Uh, and within one year, I got a scholarship, ended up playing for two years there, got drafted by the Texans, and have been fortunate to have a seven-year career. So the all-in bet paid off in the end, and uh, hopefully tonight I can get one to pay off, too. That'd be pretty <laughs> sweet. So you say it, it, it paid off. So you left Wisconsin, and here's what I've noticed. You were the 11th pick of the draft in 2011. Do you know who was the 11th pick in the other sports that year? You're in, you're in good company. It was a, a good year for number 11. No. Who was Clay it? Thompson, the Warriors. Oh, very good. Champion. Champion, and a guy that you probably know pretty well right now, George Springer, the Astros. Oh, yeah. Wow, that is a strong 11th. So that, that's, yeah. a, that's a good draft, very good. draft year, right? There's two champions right there. There's only one thing missing from that. So this year. No pressure or anything, year. man, but let's figure this out. What people here would probably want to know, or at least what I would want to know, so I'm going to ask the question, what's next for J.J. Watt? I mean, Leslie Jones is here, so you can, I'm sure you want to do some Saturday Night Live at some point. We could do Maybe some of that. Maybe you can rub elbows with her, but what's, what's next? Uh, the number one most immediate thing for me is getting back on the field. Uh, it's the game I love. It's the sport I and love. And it's going well. It's going really well. It's going good. Yeah, it's You're going, feeling good. It's going really well. I've had a great couple of weeks. I want to get back on the field and be the player that I know I can be and be, be myself. I want to just, I love that feeling. Um, but also, I think there is some, there's some other things that I could do, whether it's movies, whether it's TV, whether Leslie wants to bring me on Saturday Night Live yeah. at some point. See, it's such um, a buddy. Such but I, also, this, the hurricane relief is going to be going on for me for at least the next year and a half. 
I mean, it's such a long process, and it takes so long, and the recovery is, is long. Um, so I'm still focused on that, making sure that we, we do that the right way, because that's my number one priority, is making sure that I do that the right way by the people who donated, by the families we're helping. I just want to make sure that I do that right, because people trusted me, and I want to make sure that keeps going the right direction. Um, and then I want to become the third number 11 pick from that draft to win a Super Bowl. That'd be great. <laughs> so that would be. And sign Thank it? You. Yeah, sign it. So our time is just about done here. The J.J. Watt signature. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. It, uh, it was a lot of fun. I've seen you guys have completely taken over Vegas, by the way. I literally can't walk He's around. He's pretty impressed by that. He's it's everywhere. It's unbelievable. Look, wow. I know, I'm dead serious. So you walk around, you're like, geez, there's an Adobe credential. There's an Adobe credential. Does anybody else live here? Is anybody else here? <laughs> but uh, it's been awesome. You guys have been great to talk to around the hotel and around the casino and see you. So thank you guys all for your hospitality. I appreciate it. Adobe's incredible. So thank you. Ladies and appreciate gentlemen, you JJ Watt. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. Anywhere in there? These guys.